we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome this morning, everyone. Good morning from San Francisco Public Library. My name is Kelsey. I am a librarian here in the Magazines and Newspaper Center at the main branch in Civic Center, fifth floor. Uh, we're very happy to have our program today with uh, Fahim Majid and Shola Jamo. Uh, welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get the program started, I am going to go through a couple announcements just to let you know what we're doing in the Magazines and Newspaper Center. Uh, so first of all, uh, you'll be getting this link in the chat in a second, but this is our magazines and newspapers website through the SFPL website. So this is a great place to come to see what other programs we're going to be offering in the future. So you can see here that um, uh, in March, we're going to have an online tutorial about using consumer reports. And also in March, we're going to have a couple in-person workshops about women's magazines, uh, basically 150 years of women's magazines. And then in April, we're going to be doing a film, a show, showing of the film The Dissident, Dissident, which is a documentary about the killing of um, Khashoggi, who was a Washington Post journalist. So hopefully you can join us for one of those. Um, also on this website, you can get our link to our blog, the San Francisco Public Library Magazines and Newspaper Center blog. So we put content up on here about once a week, if not more often. So you can come and check it and see what we're talking about. Uh, we have a post coming up pretty soon about new magazine archives that the library has acquired. So check back maybe Saturday or early next week for that. Now I'm going to do our land acknowledgement for the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, basically, we want to acknowledge that we're broadcasting from the unceded territory of the Ramatuja Ohlone. And I know that we might have people tuning in, tuning in here from other places all around the country. So I encourage you to look up uh, whose land you're living on. Um, we're going to put some links in the chat. You can use the website whose land or native land to see. So this is the unceded territory, and we, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to to live, work, and um, do educational activities on this land. Okay, so uh, this program is being recorded. It's also being live streamed on YouTube. And at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes to do Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, you don't have to save them to the end. Feel free to put those in the chat, or you can use the Q&A function of the webinar. All right, now for some introductions. Fahim Majid is an artist, educator, curator, and community facilitator. He blends his unique experience as a nonprofit administrator, curator, and artist to create works that focus on institutional critique and exhibitions that leverage collaboration to engage his immediate community, as well as the broader community, in meaningful dialogue. He is the co-founder and co-director of the Arts Collective Floating Museum, Majid received BFA from Howard University and his MFA from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Shola Jimo is currently a second year PhD student in the Department of Performance Studies at Northwestern University. She graduated from the University of Illinois Chicago in 2022, receiving a Bachelor of Arts in Public Health with the highest distinction. Under the leadership and guidance of Fahim Majid, Shala has served as a research assistant on several interdisciplinary archival projects concerning Black American histories or stories in, in the arts and beyond. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing, hand things over to our wonderful presenters, and please take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful invitation. I just I wanted to thank um, uh, everyone in the, the libraries and staff and everyone for the invitation. It's uh, very humbling, actually, to be doing this presentation. I feel like I'm going coast to coast from, mm -hmm. from, from, from New York to California. So it's wonderful to be here. I thought um, uh, what we could do, uh, Shala, if that's okay, is uh, actually treat this a little bit like a studio visit, um, a little more casual. Um, um, you know, a little more open to discourse. Um, um, so I'll be checking. We will be checking questions as we go along um, as well. So, you know, we will have a Q&A section, but if there's something that, you know, jumps out and we're able to answer it, we can do that along the way. So unlike, uh, I also, uh, what we're gonna, I'm going to do is actually share my screen on my laptop. I'm going to give this a try. Um, because I don't actually trust PowerPoints. They always freeze on me. So I'm, I'm very much uh, willing to show kind of the workings behind the window. So I thought we'd start with a little bit of design inspirations of kind of like how I got to the project, 
uh, what are some things that uh, kind of stick out. And then we'll do a little bit of show and tell. And uh, Shalai will talk uh, about um, her role as a researcher um, and her experience. And then uh, we'll look at some pretty pictures along the way. So if that's okay, we'll kind of get started. Um, let me share my screen. And I'll give also give a little more of a introduction to who I am. Um, so I'm an artist, and uh, uh, although the work is in New York on the High Line, by the way, I also want to thank the High Line, uh, Melanie Kress, who uh, really was integral in making this project happen. Um, uh, uh, but I was approached a little while ago uh, to take part and create a proposal uh, for the Plinth Project on the High Line. And as I tell all of my kind of artists, all my students, because I'm also a professor, um, is that you should always apply because you just never know who's watching. And sometimes many of my greatest uh, kind of uh, 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 events or, or commissions or artworks actually have come at, from being in the room. Um, so I applied. Unfortunately, I was not selected. Um, it was a very competitive public uh, competition. I was one of 50. Um, but then uh, the High Line, Melanie Crest, specifically approached me about maybe thinking about another version. So the images that you're seeing here are actually of the original proposal. Um, and I'll get in a little bit into the inspirations a little later, um, or better yet, now. So what you're looking at is um, a much larger structure than what ended up landing. Um, let's slide a little over to uh, some of the design uh, ideas. Uh, let's see here. Here we go. Um, so as I said, I'm actually in, we're, we're located. I'm in Chicago. I'm a Chicago-based artist. A lot of my training comes from here. Uh, specifically, when I came here, I spent a lot of time at an organization, an 80-plus-year-old uh, organization now, uh, called Southside Community Arts Center. It came out of the WPA. And while I was there, I was really inspired, um, uh, and I'm still there, really inspired by the Wall of Respect. Wall of Respect was kind of initiated by an artist named William Walker. And the reason why, you know, many of us have seen murals uh, over the years, but this was kind of erected in 1967. Um, as a part, uh, it became kind of um, the beginning of the community murals movement, specifically Chicago murals movement. Um, and this was a collection of numerous artists um, and, and, and poets and performers that kind of erected this kind of wall. I like to think about it almost like social media, the wall or the comments section uh, in its design. And um, there were numerous, it was kind of a live painting. And the reason why this was kind of so unique was that it was kind of adopted, it was adopted by the community. So it was uh, protected by local gangs um, that were there. Poets would come, it was a safe space, and actually uh, eventually kind of was burned down to the ground. And there's a lot of, I encourage you to dig a little deeper around its impact and its history. And a lot of things kind of came out of this moment. It's 1967, so we're dealing with civil rights. We're dealing, you know, we're in a space where the Nation of Islam is thriving. Um, there's so much going on with this mural. But I like this idea of a community mural, a space where people join, a space where things are lives, a space where things are changing day to day as things come in. Um, and that's kind of how it functioned um, in a space that at the time we didn't have a digital age. So there was no kind of updating. There was no social media. But this is a space where it happened. It started here and then it moved down the street, across the street. And there are many walls that kind of came off of this. So... Um, uh, the spirit of this, the spirit of the newspaper really was inspiring. In, in regards to form, I was really interested into Dogon architecture, specifically pill houses, um, thinking about this kind of uh, handcrafted, handmade, very African kind of inspired. Um, um, and these are just some of the images I used in thinking about the design of the form, thinking about grids, um, kind of in, 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 in Dogon architecture um, as well. And then primarily where this came about was thinking also about outdated media sources. So it's called Freedom uh, Stand, um, and it's really inspired by the first black newspaper uh, in New York called Freedom's Journal in uh, 1827, right? Shall I, did I get, I, I messed dates up. I'm, it's 1827, right? 
Did I get that right? Sometime in the 1800s. It's 1800, 1827. We're almost yeah. 100, uh, 200 years later. Um, so uh, in, in context to design, I was thinking about newspaper stands and how kind of similar to kind of Dogon pill houses and things like that, they're kind of, there's a lot of eye involved, like, like, like the hand is involved in, in functionality. So in Chicago, we have these kind of grandfathered in uh, uh, newspaper stands that still are erected. They don't really function. Usually there's like two old guys sitting out front uh, with a cup of coffee, and they become like these social spaces because people aren't buying newspapers from the corners anymore. But the role that the newspapers stand as a space of gathering, right, um, of uh, the, dealing with um, the Great Migration, you know, the Defender newspaper was integral in sending things with Pullman Porter down south, educating people on jobs in the north, how to transition and behave as they move north. Um, you know, the revolutionary kind of idea of a black newspaper and a black voice. So here's just some examples of those newspaper stands I talked about where the, it's really about functionality. And they kind of are reminiscent of shacks. You know, and shanties that are that come, you know, that I think of when I go to South Africa and things. So I just kind of started there. Some of the inspirations around these kind of newspaper stands, that gathering spaces, tiny, modular, or Dogon architecture. And then in in regards to process, I was, um, you know, this is an image I took while we were actually installing. A uh, thing about like wheat pasting, like the the the, temp the temporariness of wheat pasting, uh, how there's always layers underneath. And I was really interested in this tuft underneath. And I, I was hoping to think about like a newspaper stand of the cosmos that was kind of putting headlines up from a 200 year kind of expanse, you know, and the idea of layering these newspapers. So each month uh, I work with the high line to get wheat pasters to come and wheat paste content on top of content, on top of content. I gave them freedom to say, hey, if something's kind of spray painted over, ripped, blew in the wind, then just go right over that. Just go right over that. It's actually the highlight of the wind tunnel. And it was actually a very challenging thing to do. The whole thing was that it was supposed to be kind of like, like temporary and constantly evolving and moving. So those are some of the uh, like content um, uh, as well. I want to get back into some of these images. So this is kind of the, what was proposed in the beginning. Um, I worked with my partner, uh, Floyd Museum, Andrew Shackman, to design uh, some of the layout um, from the images they gave us for the plinth. But um, once that wasn't selected, Melanie Kress approached me and the staff approached me about maybe coming up with a different version, a smaller version, um, which actually connected more to its original inspirations of pill houses and uh, newspaper stands. Uh, and in here is just kind of like how it evolved um, um, digitally and how we thought about the application. So um, there's a number of larger ones and smaller ones that um, alternately get rotated out each month. And uh, Shala uh, and I, well, Shala primarily led in kind of uh, uh, finding archives, and she's going to talk about that a little later, um, uh, to kind of narrow down these newspaper stands. I mean, the real point is about voice and ownership of voice. So all of these are black owned newspapers um, that were managed and run um, by African-Americans. Um, many of them don't exist anymore. Some of them still exist. Um, and it's really this notion of world news through a black voice versus black news through a controlled voice. Um, so many of the newspapers don't actually deal with black topics. They actually deal with world events because black news is world news. Um, and it's just about control of voice, one's voice. Um, yeah, let's get to the fun stuff. Uh, I'll show a couple images of the actual stand itself. Um, it's actually very humbling being on a high line because when you go down, and as an artist, I get to sit. Uh, for those that are familiar with New York, it's right outside of the Shed Museum near the 30th, I think the 30th Street entrance. Um, so the entrance is, is amazing. It sits right across from where the docents and the tour guides are. So I was able to talk to them and, and, and it's like almost having your own tour guy always set up outside. But this is uh, the, when it was uh, after it was installed and I came back. 
uh, this was just a, a mother and a daughter who were just sitting out there, and I got to kind of observe their kind of initial reaction to it. And I was just, uh, we decided to take some pictures together, and she was kind of walking through her knowledge of Booker T. Washington. Um, and, yeah, you know, and just watching kind of like international artists from all over the world coming and spending so much time with it. It's uh, very humbling and um, exciting. Part of it. Here's just some images of the piece. And you can see um, the wood itself was actually pulled from former housing um, uh, here in Chicago. Uh, some of it was burned, some of it was etched, but it was aged. So there's these large timbers, and there's kind of a greeting that happens inside, once again, inspired by Dogon architecture not a one-to-one, -one. but the idea is that uh, even beyond the board, you can see through and it creates shadows and lines within the actual structure itself. Um, and yeah, those are kind of, we pasted up or plastered and stapled, and then they kind of weather and alternate as time goes on. And it clashes. I think one of the reasons why it sticks out so much is it clashes with all kind of the new. Um, there's a lot of uh, investment in architecture and design in this area, really shiny, really big. And here's this kind of humbling, powerful kind of image-based uh, architecture that's made of wood um, that is very different from its surroundings. And like I said, uh, we can definitely come back later uh, if there are other, let me move that out the way, other questions. Um, as we go along. I just, um, I think what I would like to do now is invite um, Shala maybe to introduce herself a little more. And uh, we're going to kind of, I told her, we're going to do a little bit of show and tell uh, to talk about our archive and process. Uh, Shala, would you be okay to come on and point A to point B, talk about kooky Professor Fahim that just kind of came out of nowhere and just is always like, figure it out. And then we just do something. And I'm like, that's perfect. And you're like, really? Because you didn't tell me what to do. Um, uh, so yeah, maybe uh, come on, come on and talk about uh, our relationship a little bit. Sure. So my name is Shala. Um, as mentioned previously, I'm currently a PhD student at Northwestern. But my work with this project emerged while I was still in undergrad. Um, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, which is where Fahim also teaches. And we had been introduced a year or two prior to beginning work on this project. Um, and I had done similar or analogous kind of researching archival work on a project centered on the Southside Community Arts Center. Um, but this project emerged during my senior year, my final year of undergrad. And I just remember we were having a meeting about uh, my honors thesis. And you mentioned this project and potentially wanting me to come on board um, and assist with the research process. And I was super interested. And I think things just got started right after that. I think the initial prompt, I was given this website that had aggregated African-American newspapers by state. And it was just this long list of websites, some still functional, some not, but it was this really comprehensive list of names of African-American newspapers, which was especially useful because it was already kind of bifurcated by state. And my research began with this list, translating it from this website into a more operational Excel document. Uh, so that's, I guess, with the, the newspapers that were selected for the purposes of this project, they all came from that list more or less. And in regards to the actual selection of the headlines, I remember we had an, another conversation thinking about best practices in regards to methodology. I want to know if there was any specific inclusion or exclusion criteria I should be looking for in terms of selecting from these newspapers because we had, I think the list was almost like 200 well, a little more than 200 yeah. newspapers was on that that list that was translated to Excel. So it was a, it felt like a very kind of insurmountable task at first to decide what to select and what not to select. 
so we had this conversation and I proposed the idea of maybe making selections by a period of time. So the actual mm-hmm. organization of the headlines in the kind of internal, I don't want to say database, but like the internal system, the inter- internal filing system where they're stored is that they are organized by half centuries from mm-hmm. beginning in 1800 and ending 2020 or 2021. I can't quite recall. Yep. Um, so it's five, essentially five buckets of half centuries. And this number was proposed of trying to find like 300 to 350 headlines. So right. for each bucket, there's like 70, 70 headline selections in each bucket. All right, so there's 200 newspapers in total from a range of like historical, well, 200 plus newspapers in total from a range of historical to contemporary, some not in, not in existence, some still publishing regularly, either online or in print. And from that 200 plus selection of newspapers, there's five buckets um, with 70 headlines in each bucket. So in total, there's just about 350, maybe even more, because sometimes I would go overboard, um, 350 to 400 headlines, perhaps, that have been selected for the purposes of this work, but not necessarily installed in the actual um, material freedom stand Mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. And to talk about selection criteria in regards to how headlines were chosen, it wasn't, uh, it was not a very scrupulous kind of didactic process. I remember in part of that conversation on how many headlines to select, there was also this conversation about how to make choices in regards to what to select. And Fahim didn't necessarily offer any kind of strict, rigid guideline of things that he wanted to see. It was more so this kind of amorphous thing of grabbing headlines that were appealing to me individually because of the graphics, because of the historical material they're working through. So a lot of these selections are a matter of, I don't want to say my individual preference, but the kind of things that were individually intriguing to my eye. But then there's another layer of oversight whereby like the actual headlines from that pool of 350 to 400, the actual headlines that were selected were determined by Fahim. And that's maybe like less than half of that that number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah. so. Yeah, I really needed, what I realized was, it's kind of like the thing that is good enough because there's layers of design, right? The whole point, like you gotta think about like, what's the role of the newspaper? And the role of the newspaper is to inform, but also to sell newspapers. Like, like even understanding when we talked about how newspapers function in the 1800s, which is very different from how they function in contemporary times. We, I think we think about newspapers as like the spinning headlines kind of coming at you. That's not actually how any of that work. Advertisements were on the front pages because advertisements, like, like everything was different. The splash was different. They're actually, some of them were very boring in the front end. So the big, the big splash didn't really work that way. But then you get kind of like, there's personalities in different newspapers, which I'm going to show a little later. Like, like some of them are trying to suck you in almost like tabloids. So, so there's, there's that too, you know? So um, once again, it's like, but it's all designed. So someone spent time to design it. Someone spent time to make it available because they want, just like a newspaper, they want people to see this work. They want it out there. So many of the things, to to, to your point, we're, we're, you know, we're still building on this archive and this project, a a much, you know, larger. Uh, Hopefully we can bring it to California. A little hint there, if there's anyone out there with some playing fair and a big truck. Um, But we can do an infinite amount of these um, because every day there's like 400 black newspapers producing work every day. Uh, and all those things are designed. So they're screaming to be seen. They want to be seen. So the generosity was that someone had already, some archivist or some community member had already put it out there with the hope that someone like myself and Shalai would come along and talk about it. So we didn't have to do, like initially when I started this, I thought we were going to have to go deep in the stacks. I thought, right, yeah, yeah, right. 
uh, I thought we had to go deep in the stacks. I thought we had to go uncovering microfiche and all these things. And I realized, oh, you know, it quickly it became <laughs> like it was, it was a glut of, of newspapers. That, so we had to find criteria to edit it down for one newspaper stand, even if we were putting up stuff every day. Like we did it every month, we alternated, but it was actually very hard because it's history over 200 years. It's, it's, it's fascinating to watch. You lose yourself in this. I mean, any archivist in here understands that. Any library understands how you can get lost in a library. Uh, so quickly this became an issue. So having Shalad do a kind of a first phase, the challenge of kind of like building out the walls, parameters of what she wanted. And then I also had a studio assistant, Josh, who also helped me kind of narrow things down and scan things in and things that just didn't scan in well. Like we, we had to figure out ways of kind of editing out to get it down. And then we still went over our mark. To Shalad's point, we still had too many. Um, so it was a very challenging, but also hopeful in thinking about a village of newspaper stands or a whole cityscape of newspaper stands could easily kind of happen. So it leaves hope. Um, I'm excited about what happens when it comes down and we move on to the next couple phases of this project. But the Black Voice is not myopic. It's expansive and also conflicting. Like that's what so exciting about this is that the assumption there is no like there's some very conservative very liberal very like extravagant homophobic uh you know i mean there's the expanse of this is really fascinating to think about when oftentimes we're uh the black voice is pigeonholed and controlled uh, anyway i'm sorry to jump in shalai do you, you want to go through some of your uh your best of and i don't even know how you pick these um sure so the, is this... I, I grouped the, the first couple ones are content based and the other ones are visual okay okay so um i selected some headlines from our large large pool of 300 plus that i found both either historically important or graphically appealing. And this one comes from the Denver Star, so a Black newspaper in Colorado, which I found historically important because as I was searching through some of these newspapers, particularly those that came from the like 19th and 20th century, I found it interesting which historical and political events were of importance or of interest to Black Americans at the time compared to how they circulate in popular imaginary in our contemporary moment. So with this newspaper, the 50th anniversary of our freedom should interest all of us deeply. I found it particularly interesting that some of these more historical Black newspapers were celebrating the 13th Amendment or and or the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and I found that particularly interesting because of how discourses on Abraham Lincoln circulate now in our contemporary moment. Um, people seem more readily available or readily knowledgeable to acknowledge the fact that Lincoln did not necessarily kind of abolish slavery because of his interest in disbanding it as a system, but as a kind of tactical political move. Um, that was arguably acting in his own self-interest as a politician, as opposed to any interest in the abolition of slavery for morality's sake. Um, so I found it particularly interesting, like with this example, because of how Abraham Lincoln has been re-articulated at present, to see truthfully that if you take it from a historical outlook, that he was conceived of quite differently um, the abolition of slavery and the political acts that most materially were involved in the abolition of slavery circulate much differently in this more historical context, which really enriches understanding of, I think, this aspect of American history. Um, but I was particularly fascinated by the, the actual idea of celebrating these dates. I don't know, like I, I have no immediate recollection of when the 13th Amendment was passed, when the Emancipation Proclamation was um, ratified. I have no idea of those dates, but seeing in some of these historical newspapers how often like these anniversaries would be marked and celebrated as headlines, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found super mm -hmm. interesting. And I think it's very historically mm -hmm. important in considering the nature of American politics and the evolution of American politics. Let's see here. 
Ah, uh, here we go. This is a good one. Oh, this I love is, these. yeah, a graphically appealing selection, but it also has important historical resonances. But this is um, W. E. Du Bois. Du Bois. Uh huh. Um, and if you see at the top, there's this tiny, like the Negro exhibit at Paris. Mm -hmm. But this was like a really important kind of expo um, mm -hmm. that was done at the, the World's Fair in Paris, I think in mm -hmm. 1900, mm -hmm. um, which is both kind of historically important. But I just think that this image which is also incredibly eye-catching because there are these all these juxtapositions happening. There's the juxtaposition of actually the, the nomenclature by which we talk about Black Americans, right? So a newspaper called The Colored American gesturing towards the time period in which this newspaper was produced, but also this image of W.E.B. Um, well, it's just like the image of him juxtaposed by all these other photographs in the background. I think it's such an right. interesting contrast especially because of the magnitude yeah. of the images in comparison to him mm -hmm. he's a much smaller mm -hmm. focal point in this in this image and i even think mm -hmm. like this as a headline challenges the dominant visual archive through which we conceive of newspaper headlines because the text yeah. on this page is quite minimal and it's really demanding that we engage the image and I think there's so much depth to the image that it's kind of left unknown or understated if you don't know what's happening here or who's in here or what this event is about. Right. And then also there's images of Booker T. Washington in the state, which also kind of they were often put against each other in, in, in ways as rivals in some sort of way. Or that's how it's kind of sometimes preached the complexity of that relationship versus um, kind of dulled down. Let's keep moving here. I see. See, I told y'all we go deep. Like we we ain't even got through two. We 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 on the second image. Like like we got four hundred to go. Like so, mm -hmm. it's it's exciting. But uh, but yeah, here we go. Yes, I chose this one. This is a more contemporary newspaper, right? It comes from nineteen eighty seven. Um. Public knowledge, public hypervisibility of HBCUs over the last few decades, I feel like has increased tenfold. You see how much kind of like, even just like Black History Month marketing, how much HBCUs are involved in like the public circulation of images celebrating Black history at present in ways that it was not necessarily, I don't think that corporations were seeking out graduates from HBCUs decades and decades and decades ago to help surmount these <laughs> marketing efforts. But I found this particular headline to be very historically interesting or important to me because, right, Spelman College is an HBCU, but it's uh, like a gender exclusive HBCU, it's for all women. And I found it particularly interesting that 1987 was the year when Spel Spelman welcomed its first black woman president because it, it sort of invites the reader to consider the histories of HBCUs and their formations, especially as kind of like land grant institutions. There are these assumptive logics by which we might think that HBCUs are always already extending kind of leadership and administrative roles to Black Americans, but that's not necessarily how they were initiated um, in a historical sense, which has right. resonances for the types, the types of things that they're able to do in more contemporary contexts, right? So Spellman, hmm, when was Spellman founded? It was a long time ago. <laughs> so I, I you know, um, I don't know when it was founded, but I know it was a long time ago. And I think that's I think, fascinating. Yeah. Like, I've seen this one out, you know, I did, it's, I don't know why, I just, yeah, that is like, it's, 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 a, it was found as a space for black women. But uh, 1987 is, is, so there is some irony uh, a little bit in, in that. Um, mm -hmm. Once again, about even black voice, like you think about in spaces that are considered 
or, or conceived as black run, black own, there's a complexity in that as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's a that's a that's a good one. I mean, yeah, we what what do you want to do? So we got we got you know. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. 1881. So, you know, almost a hundred, a little over a hundred years. That's all it takes. Um, but, you know, it's complex. I'm sure we could spend all day just talking about that. So do you want to, let, let's jump ahead because I think, yeah, I'm looking at this. We, we're, we're coming up on 136. Um, okay. This one, yeah. So let's, let's, let's talk about this, this, this series that came up quite a bit. Yeah, so this is, we. there are several newspapers in our kind of aggregated list that come from political organizations, as opposed to these more journalistic minded newspapers that have an interest in kind of reporting on news, uh, newspapers that are interested or have a more conspicuous kind of political motivation, right? So this is from the Black Panther Party, their kind of intercommunal news service. And I think that with these political types of newspapers, they tend to be much more subversive and attentive to graphics. So this is a headline that has, I think, graphic appeal because it's about sickle cell anemia, which is, I mean, it's, a, it's a, such an important kind of biomedical thing to be aware of and be thinking of, right? Lupus and sickle cell anemia as conditions that seem to disproportionately affect Black people across the diaspora. Um, but I think that the attentiveness of this political organization to a condition that's not necessarily or not as kind of explicitly mediated by politics is fascinating to me. Right. So the Black Panther Party, the extent of its invocation of politics to consider the personal, the communal, the biomedical, the cultural. Mm -hmm. um, I found this particularly striking, both in its its kind of the image that it imposes, but also the language, like the approach to language yeah. of these more political yeah, newspapers yeah. is right. Has a, yeah. a huge contrast to some of these. Yep. I, I don't know if I should say traditionalist, but newspapers you know, that are more focused on I something like to, different. I'm, I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit, um, and I pull. I didn't necessarily pull them out, but um, we're gonna jump back into the studio. Um, there were, to your point, um, I, I think it is important that we actually do look at the. Uh, th these are the buckets that I was talking about. Um, but this one is actually a little, uh, you know, we're just going to kind of do this here. Um, this one here is actually a Freedom's Journal. This is like one of the first black newspapers. Um, and we, 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 we didn't find, because we weren't digging deep, I'm sure if we went to the uh, Library of Congress, we could pull some of these out. But... Um, you know, e even in it kind of being a little more conservative, it's all text driven. Um, and and uh, to be honest, when you put this up, it, it was pretty much present in all, it's still up. So I always want to make sure there was a Freedom's Journal somewhere in the, but it's the one you don't see, right? Um, and there's all types of reasons uh, uh, for that. Um, Shala, we, we had this really great conversation where we were interviewed uh, by a black newspaper uh, that I actually I think is in the collection. The um, what was the name of the paper again? I'm blanking. My my, my memory. Amsterdam bad. News. The Amsterdam News, right? And uh, they're still functioning, and we had a really great kind of covering of that. But in that conversation, one of the things that really jumped out to me about what Shala said was the, the like if you think about 1829, this was 1828. Uh, um, access to reading and what it meant to read especially in a black community, right? So you think about literacy, you think about the ability to have money to spend on something like a newspaper. It was an extravagance. So things are often recycled. So it's like the black, it, it's even more complex than it is now. There are even things that we take for granted in the sense of even be having access to education, 
right? Access in, in, in wealth to get this. So this is a very niche, I would think a niche market, right? So as much as this is about, this is a black voice, it, it's probably for white audiences. You know, as so much of a, you know, it's like a way of kind of a, 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 an I-N. And I'm just, you know, I wasn't there, so I don't know. But you just think about the things that are going on, the current events, and how people, like, like, like also just, like, the danger of voice and how it maybe goes against, you know, people's interests. So, you know, it's like, it's a very different thing. Like, like the Freedom Journal can't say black genocide, you know, like, you know, they can't say, you know, assassination, like there's just these things just, just, just are really powerful when you put one thing. That's one thing I love is like putting this, like thinking about putting the paper from 200 years ago next to this one from, you know, you know, re- uh, recently, uh, which is uh, really exciting. So this is um, in the archive. Another thing, um, one is uh, maybe a little bit too, shall I, some of the things that just kind of popped up often, uh, uh, this one I really love down here, this series. I just, I loved it so much because of the, the colored American magazine. Once again, the, the one we looked at earlier, this is some some of the other ones that really were designed beautifully um, um, as well. Um, some really wonderful kind of pieces aesthetically. So some of the, the, the prompts were about content, but it's also about I. Like, so, you know, I made sure, like, more almost conservative um, uh, to a certain extent, but uh, oftentimes had really, yeah, great things. Jump through a couple of them because I'm on Q&A and uh, we can continue through Q&A if, if we want. seems like once again, we need uh, more time. Um, uh, to think the uh, patterns, maybe uh, should I talk a little bit about patterns? This is one that comes up a lot. Wars. Yes. The yeah, patterns so of like, the wars, like like so war, uh, like like lynching, mm-hmm. like if you think about things that pop up over two hundred years. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the ones that I really think is interesting is uh, talking about um, uh, uh, anti-vaxxing. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the ones, but not from 2020, but 1920, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so that that was kind of an interesting one. Like the cyclicalness of things is interesting. Like it's like we're talking about Emmett Till, we're talking about George Floyd, we're talking about going to war in Desert Storm, we're talking about going to war in World War II. You know, it's like these things that are impacting the black community and in, in the world in general. It's like it's like it's almost like if you just go through just this. This is just one type of lens on an archive, the repetitiveness, cyclical nature of it. It's, um, you know, I'm really into Marvel. So I just think about the time loops and the timelines and how it just feels like, we're just like, <laughs> like going back in time and doing the same things over and over and over. It can be, it's fascinating. I don't know if there are any others that you noticed. Yeah. Just to speak to the subject of war, it's reminding me that there are quite a few newspapers on the list that are coming from all black infantries during various mm. periods of wartime which is also something interesting to consider um in terms of why that specific subject reappears in addition to you know newspapers beyond the context of military but in regards to themes or thematic i'm thinking specifically about the early to mid 20th century just that time period of like 1900 so like maybe 1950s or so how so many of the newspaper headlines seem to revolve around like the totalizing conditions of segregation or negation exclusion denial like the overlapping and compounded effects mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. racism mm-hmm. segregation both de facto and de jure I feel like it takes such a big or just a more pronounced precedence during that specific time period than 
arguably arguably both before and afterwards. I think the approach to the topic prior to the 1900s has to be more clandestine, has to approach it almost with circumlocution, like talking around it as opposed to talking about it. But then from like the 1900s to like late 1960s, early 1970s, the approach to these topics seems to be much more visceral. Like they're very descriptive in describing what precisely is happening in terms of articulating the Black condition at present. Um, That's both striking, but kind of disorienting because Mm. the way these Mm -hmm. things are talked about currently feels so different feels less Mm. visceral except for specific moments of rupture like very big hyper visible deaths murders what have you and there's a way in which like during this period of like the 1900 to 1960s late early 1970s where this type of violence feels almost so quotidian and mundane that it reappears Mm -hmm. like every newspaper every other headline in this during this time period because it's there's a kind of naturalization of this violence that feels more spectacular at present that when those newspapers are happening like in the 21st century it feels much different it -hmm. feels more anomalous more irregular than how it was constructed during that time period i think maybe that's like a theme that i noticed Mm -hmm. while i was pulling Mm -hmm. from yeah those those years yeah, I think I think we're at 148, and uh, more than likely, I think we can maybe address some of the questions in the prompt. I'm going to shout out Nubian News, which my uncle Kuji Chakalia runs out of New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, I was able to slip in a couple of uh, my family newspapers and Rolling Out magazine as well, um, uh, which is my uh, partner Munson Steed and Steed Foundation that actually is also operating uh today so yeah so i think that's awesome i love the personal connection that's great yeah yeah. Yeah, i'm just commenting that i love that you got some newspaper people in your family that's cool so we do have a couple questions that have come in um i have them here so the first question was from linda she says, astounded mm-hmm. by the number of Black-owned newspapers that existed, do you know how the earliest ones from the 1820s and 1830s were funded? I I don't necessarily, I did read that. I don't have that at top of head, but um, the Freedom uh, Journal did not last very long um, and made way for another newspaper, which I think might actually be the Amsterdam News, if I'm not mistaken. But it had a very short life, um, and I'm not exact. I, you know, I, I, without actually saying, I think a lot of them might even been Quaker uh, kind of initiatives uh, as well, uh, kind of that type of network of support. Um, but a lot, yeah. There's a there was an article that I was reading that talked a lot about like the origins of that and like some of the challenges as well. So I don't have a concrete, but hopefully in the next editions we'll have that. We have to. Get back on a lecture circuit. So uh, we got we got to get out here in the world. Um, I think it yeah, it's maybe also important context that because some of these earlier newspapers are started by freedmen, um, yeah. they have the capacity to work in more professional settings and fund even if marginally these newspapers to a higher degree than say enslaved Black Americans at the time. Um, but I think freedmen often are working in religious positions, like ecclesiastical positions. So there is a kind of religious affiliation there. Mm-hmm. That was definitely the case for the first African-American paper in California called The Mirror of the Times. Mm-hmm. It was like very oh. much connected to um, people who came out, they're businessmen, but also preachers. And so mm-hmm. um, and really connected to the colored conventions that were started to happen in California in like the early 1850s. And so it was like, yeah, but just as Fahim pointed out at the beginning, newspapers are supposed to be a business. So, you know, it was yeah. to spread the word about stuff, but also to make money. So. Right. Exactly. And if you didn't do that, then you weren't going to have a newspaper. <laughs> it wasn't a yeah. service. It wasn't. It wasn't seen as a service 
like a social service. It was a money making, generating. And so many of the early newspapers, they just like, yeah, one year, two years, then they're gone and they just cycled through. Like there's like so many newspapers that cycled through in the first like 15 years of California's right. history, for example. So um, yeah, cool. Okay. So now we also have a question from Julia. Do you have a next site where the piece will go? So you're joking about bringing um, it out here to the West Coast, but do you have any plans for where it'll go next? I would love, I would love that. As I say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm open to suitors. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 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 nothing concrete. I am working on something, uh, here in Chicago, a version of it. Um, but also bringing it back in the studio. I do want to continue working with Shala on some other, uh, like a series of work built off of this body of work. But, um, this is kind of the public facing area, but then there's also kind of the research and then kind of the, you know, the artwork that I would like to make off of this, um, collaborations and things like that. So nothing concrete as of yet, but um, there will be something probably in relationship to it. I'm still designing it um, here in Chicago in the next year or so. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if anyone has any kind of, you know, I'm getting half my name around. I'm, I, I love to come to the African work, work and do something there. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah, you got, you got, you got to sell yourself, Sean. You got, you got, you got to get out here with your little sign and flip it, and you know, just tax time, tax season. You got, <laughs> you got to get out here. We got to get out here. We got to sell. <laughs> um, so we have a comment from Kimberly. She says, "Wonderful presentation. Thank you." Um, thank you. No, thank from you my, so for I do. I have a question for my librarian hat, <laughs> and actually, I love the way your presentation is. I, I like seeing your archive there and your naming convention and how you've saved all of yeah. those images and everything. <laughs> right, so right, I don't want right. to geek out too hard on the librarian aspect, but at the same time, a couple of questions. Um, do you have mm -hmm. any California newspapers in it? And also, I'm just like mm -hmm. curious about. You said like there was a glut of newspapers, like these images just kind of came to you and it was actually mm -hmm. very easy to find it. And then in my experience, sometimes it's like, I struggle so hard, just like the mirror of the times I was talking about from California. Like there's only mm -hmm. one digitized issue of the newspaper, like available online really. And like, I reached out to the California mm -hmm. state library and I'm like, do you, can you send me a scan of this? And it was like this big thing, like, am I going to get this? So anyway, right. I guess just if you could talk a little bit more about, yeah, that process of getting the images yeah. and compiling your archive. I got, yes. So I think at a certain point, I realized, you know, I had this idea of how it worked, right? And we did work with a librarian here at UIC. Initially, we we had a conversation about how to go about this. Like, because, like, once again, we had this idea of this kind of deep stacks research. And um, it, it was just like, so. so all this that we've had so far is still just like literally just a little bitty scratch in the surface and i think we might actually have some california newspapers but when we got too much resistance because like for instance i don't have many defender defender newspapers in here from chicago you, you really can't talk about black newspapers mm -hmm. uh without talking about the defender mm -hmm. but there's a challenge with you know right now you know them being in transition access to archivists access to stuff like it's just it, it, it took like five steps to get there mm -hmm. right but we didn't have five step time and you know so the the, the the understanding is this is just one in many and like we will go back and get those things but there was just so much low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. and someone had already done the work so we were really building on the shoulders of the work that people had already kind of done and this wasn't like an official, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't like an official library site, Library of Congress. It was like someone literally like just went and just, it was just hyperlinks. And then we go into the hyperlink and that hyperlink would link to another hyperlink. And some of them were like, like really low res and some were like high res. And then you'll go in and it'd be like 200 of one thing and then five of another. So it's, it, 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 yeah, we didn't even scratch the surface of the surface we scratched in this process. <laughs> So it's, it's, it's a lot of information. It's not like a magazine. It's daily. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, it's a lot of days between over 200 years. <laughs> <laughs> but Shala, she, she did a lot of the mining, so. Yeah, um, so I actually tried to strike a valence in terms of selecting newspapers by states. So 
each state is in fact represented in the larger pool of like 350 ish headlines i think from california because it's a, you know a larger state and it was especially active during time periods in which black newspapers were not yet in existence in some parts of the country there was a significant number of newspapers that came from california i think there was about like 20 or 25 in the in our yeah, thought, yeah. sheet yeah but um in regards to the selection of images from archives I, I agree or I would concur with the kind of low hanging fruit sentiment. I think some of the images that ultimately ended up in being installed in Freedom Stand came from the archives or online databases that were more robustly funded and operated. Mm -hmm. So I think the Library mm -hmm. of Congress's Chronicling America archive, it's publicly available, like it's one the archives that you can access just by searching the name of it on google whereas there are a lot of kind of paywalls even though i had access to both uic and northwestern libraries databases like two academic institutions i would still confront significant difficulties in accessing mm -hmm. certain kind of state archival databases that were hosting these newspapers um and i think that like the Library of Congress, like it was very recurrent in terms of some of the links that things were coming from, just because it seems to be interested in democratizing access to these historical records in a way that these other databases were not doing, even with the support of like very well-respected public and private institution databases. Like I was still confronting that issue of access. Um, and then there's also like for the, in, for the new, newspapers that are still in operation sometimes they maintain their own kind of internal archive on their websites that you could pull from um some of them would host there's this like i'm not quite sure how you pronounce it but there's this website called issue i-s-s-u-u -S -S -U -U, that a lot of the more contemporary newspapers would also like post online versions of their entire newspapers that you could pull headlines from um so it was oftentimes like a balance between library of congress I feel like that archive was especially enunciated in this work. Mm -hmm. Newspapers own archives and then other kind of like state archives centered around preserving historical memory. Like I know Arizona has it's like Arizona memory online database mm -hmm. that I pulled some newspapers from. Things like that, like state databases interested in preserving a, a particular kind of historical memory. Um, yeah, I think that's kind of how the selection was happening across various different means. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah you really distilled down the uh, very com the complex information environment of newspapers historical and contemporary and that's 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 what Christy and I deal with every day <laughs> in the magazine and newspaper center yeah, librarians understand yeah that's why I'm so excited I'm like oh my god the librarians are, are reaching out to us this is awesome this is amazing we we did a thing like the art you know <laughs> yeah exactly um, so we have a couple of comments. We're we're coming up on um, time, but I want to put a, a um, audio to a couple comments from YouTube viewers. So one person oh, says, great. "Beautiful presentation. Love how Fahima G can spontaneously share his rich knowledge and deeply felt enthusiasm for what he is doing while sharing his carefully planned talk and fantastic images." Um, then you. we have Thank another. Another comment from Leah, um, and love learning how Shola worked together on this beautiful art installation. Would love to see it. Very tempting as a pilgrimage destination. So if you want to do a pilgrimage, do it soon because we don't know exactly how much longer it's going to be up, at least till the end of this month, if not till March or April. Um, yeah, and then uh, a heart from our colleague Anissa, who's uh, running the YouTube stream. So yes, yes. thank you, Anissa. Uh, so and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. no, please go ahead. I was going to say we're at twelve noon, so um, I guess it's time to wrap up. But is there any last words that? Well, first of all, we pause for awesome round of applause. Oh, we could hear our people God. out there. I'm sure they're clapping and cheering. Um, so imagine all that great uh, applause in the background. Um, but do you have any last words or anything before before we say goodbye? Just I uh, want to thank thank you uh, for for reaching out. Uh, uh, Christy Farid, uh, kind of initiating this. Uh, and then I want to thank the Highline, uh, 
uh, staff, curators, for being such wonderful hosts of this project and really walking it through um, and taking a chance on it as well and not editing any of the content. So that, that actually says a lot uh, that there were no edits. There's some challenging things. In, in the news, and they never questioned anything. No one ever did. Everyone was behind it 100 percent. So that takes a lot for an institution. So I can't speak enough about the High Line and uh, their commitment to this project. So, and thank you to all the Black newspapers mm -hmm. that oftentimes are out there working. Um, the Black uh, trying to make Black voice available, not heard, not appreciated, but uh, we see you. So we appreciate it. Keep yeah. it up. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. It's so inspiring and um, it's so awesome to see yeah, information become art and then come back around to be information again. So we'll be in touch and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye. Thank you. So much. Bye-bye.